Uh, good morning, everybody. Uh, my name is Kevin Doolan. I'm the director of the Walton Institute here in uh, Waterford in Ireland. Uh, and I'm also the coordinator of the Demeter project. So it's my pleasure to invite uh, or to welcome you all to this event on behalf of uh, Demeter and uh, Smart Agri Hubs. So this is a follow on event from a, a session we ran last October. Uh, and you can actually find recordings of, of that event online on, on the Smart Agri Hubs and uh, Demeter website. Um, I suppose the key focus of this morning's event is to see how we can attract more young people and women to agriculture. Uh, and this is really important when we consider the, the current state of play in Europe. Just for example, the majority of farm holdings in the EU are currently uh, run by farmers over the age of 55. Uh, on average, only about 28.7% of farm managers are women. Uh, and if you look at this on an individual country basis, I suppose the situation is worse than that. So, for example, in the Netherlands, uh, one in 20 uh, are farmers. And similar figures can be seen in, in the likes of Malta, Denmark and Germany. From an economic perspective, uh, women's gross hourly earnings are on average uh, about 16% uh, below those of men in the EU. Uh, and additionally, the, the majority of farm ma uh, managers so so the additionally the majority of farm managers uh, really only have practical experience with very few actually less than one in ten having full agricultural uh, training or education so our projects see the emergence of agri-tech and more education as really the drivers for change uh, in this regard and that's the focus of our, our meeting today um, so Hazel Peavoy from the, the Walton Institute and Smart Agri Hubs is going to moderate today's event. Uh, please note a recording of the event will of course be made available to you uh, when it's finished. Um, and with that, I hope you enjoy and I hope you gain from this morning's meeting. Over to you, Hazel. Thank you very much, Kevin. So as Kevin said, uh, my name is Hazel um, and I'm the Regional Cluster Lead for um, Ireland and UK for Smart Agri Hubs and I'm the Strategic Business Partner for Agri at Walton Institute. And I also work um, as part of Vista Milk, which is a digital innovation node uh, located here in Ireland. So today, as Kevin said, we'd like to welcome you to our second event, The Changing Face of Agriculture. Our last event was very successful and following on from the feedback, today's event will be more interactive for you, the audience. The first part of today's event will give us the farmer's perspective, followed by a Mentimeter for you to get involved in and then Q&As. And the second part of today will involve the farm advisors, the digital innovation hub and the Irish Farmers Association's perspective on the changing face of agriculture. Please use the function and um, raise your hand for questions. You can also type them into chat and if you'd like, please include your email address because if we don't get to your question, we'll certainly um, answer it afterwards. Um, to get us started, you might also place in the chat the country that you're located in today and also let us know if you're a farmer, if you're from a company or if you're from a digital innovation hub. So to get us started today from the farmer's perspective, um, Philippa Gray will tell us um, her story and her story as a female farmer. She grew up on her family farm in Yorkshire in England and with the support of her family, she began breeding her own pedigree sheep at the age of just 14 years old. And she went on to study her master's degree in agricultural science and production systems at Harper's Adams, Harper Adams University and is currently working at Innovation for Agriculture as their fundraising manager. Through her work at IFA, she is a use case leader in the Fair Share project, which works to promote the use of digital tools within the agricultural advisory sector. And she's currently the chairperson of Local Young Farmers Club, where she's able to help educate yeah. children about farming and encourage young people. Yeah. Sorry, there's just a little bit of feedback there. Today, Philippa, Philippa will give us an overview about herself and the farm that she's on and tell us about her experiences as a female farmer. Philippa. Thank you, Hazel. Let me just share my screen. Can everyone see that okay? You might just sh uh, change to presenter mode, please, Philippa. Oh, sorry. Um, I think it is on okay. presenter mode. Are we okay? Yeah. Yeah. Great, okay. Um, so good morning everyone. Um, thank you for asking me to come and speak today and share my journey. Um, 
So as Hazel said, my name is Philippa, I'm 24 and I am from a small family farm in the north of England. Um, it is comparatively small to other farms in England, but it is quite typical to the type of farm in the area. Both my parents have main jobs alongside the farm, like myself, but we are working to try and take on more land where we can and really expand the farm into a more viable business. At the minute, we have about uh, 100 breeding ewes made up of lots of different breeds, plus followers. Um, a small native breed suckler herd, we're just in the process of transitioning breeds at the minute. And we, are, we rear calves as well. We buy them in off dairy farms and bring them on. Uh, a main aim of the farm is focusing on native and rare breeds. And we sell our stock as pedigree breeding animals, as, as fat finished animals, and through box schemes to members of the community as well. So I've always liked helping with livestock on my family farm. And as Hazel said, when I was 14, um, I was able to start my own small flock of sheep. I chose to um, purchase the Rylan breed of sheep because they were very docile, they were easy to handle for me, and I thought they were very pretty as well. Um, our main commercial flock of sheep is Texels. They're not registered. It's all about producing fat lambs for market. Whereas with the Rylands, it's all about breeding pedigree breeding stock. When I started with Rylands, they were a minority breed. They were on the rare breed watch list. So it's quite important to the breed to have people keep breeding pedigree ones and putting more females back into the national flock. And um, about eight years ago, they did actually come off the endangered list. Um, so on the, the top left and the bottom right are pictures of Rylands and um, the bottom right is one I've shown. Uh, but in the past four years, we've also gone into breeding Kerry Hills, which is the sheep on the bottom left and grey-faced Dartmoors, which are a rare breed. That's the one on the top right. Um, I do compete in a lot of with my livestock, um, mostly the Rylands at the minute. I found the agricultural community really encouraging um, and really supportive of young shepherds going into showing and breeding their own stock. Um, I was encouraged to train as an official Ryland judge when I was quite young, which was something quite intimidating at first. I had done a lot of stock judging within the Young Farmers Club organization, um, but most qualified Ryland judge for agricultural shows are generally, you know, three times my age, decades of experience, really knowledgeable people, probably slightly more males than females. And so I did wonder how I was going to get on um, training at 18. But they, uh, they qualified me, I passed, and I've been judging Rylands up and down the country for the past six years now. And we'll be doing the national show this coming summer. And I haven't found any challenges to that, everyone is extremely supportive and encouraging, which has been really nice to experience. And moving on to the digital tech that we use on our farm. As I said earlier, we're quite a small farm and at first we were very reluctant to engage in using digital technology as we didn't think it would be economically viable for us. Um, some of the initial costs do look quite expensive and we didn't know if that would be feasible for us. So we've really just been starting out on our journey of using, using digital tech this past few years. So the main things we've been using initially were um, free platforms for sales and communications and marketing our stock. So with COVID-19 restrictions, um, this past couple of years, we've chosen not to go to livestock markets as often as we would. So we haven't had the opportunity to buy and sell as much as we usually would. So for the pedigree stock, we have been using some online sales platforms. A really popular one in England is Sell My Livestock, which is a specific agricultural sales platform. But there's a few other general ones used as well. And this has worked quite well for us. Um, one example would be I bought a pedigree ram from the top of Scotland, 500 miles away. That is something I would never have done if I was just going to the local sales. It really does broaden the, the potential purchasing pool of sheep available to me by using online platforms. Um, we also use social media quite a bit for marketing our stock. So my Pedigree Rylands do have their own Facebook page and this is what we use to really push the pedigree animals we're bringing to the coming sales. 
At this time of year, it's mostly just trying to engage in some followers by putting on nice lambing pictures. So if you'd logged on to my Facebook yesterday, you'd have seen pictures of our brand new lambs we've had born this week. Um, but we mostly use this for marketing around the sales time where we will put on pictures of stock we're about to take to the sales. We will share their breeding information. We can go into more detail on any showing results they've had. And you have that time and space to share information that you wouldn't necessarily have at a market. And it really increases the reach. So this year, um, I put on some pictures of animals I was going to sell and it reached 1,400 people. I have no idea how, I don't know that many people, but the magic of the internet, it just spread around. And I did that about two weeks before the sale. So it gave any potential buyers chance to message me for any more information and hopefully increase that bit of interest by the time my animals got to market. So there could have been some more buyers. We do also use this to um, market our produce to the local community. As I've said, we do box schemes where we sell our meats um, directly to consumers. And part of our marketing of that is pushing this local um, native breed angle. And so by being able to share the story of the livestock with people being able to see the pictures of the lambs and them growing on helps the consumers engage in what we're trying to sell, hopefully. Um, but moving forward, we are looking at trying to get tech into the management side of things. So the picture on the left is um, me lambing a flock at university, and it was very much pen, paper and clipboard. And that works fine. We have reams and reams of paper and books back home with all the breeding information and records for the past few years. And while we have all the information there, it takes so long to find the information that you need that we've realized we really can improve oh, sure. our efficiency by using some management software. Um, one we already use quite regularly is Grassroots. So this is the pedigree platform that all the flock book societies in the UK use to store breeding records. So I have the app on my phone. That is a screenshot of what it would look like if I wanted to go on my phone and register the birth of one of my sheep. It's linked up to my system with all the animals I own, so I can just click which the dam is, which the sire is, get it done really simple. Um, but this tool has been most helpful in purchasing sheep. If I come across a, um, a Ryland at a market, maybe the owner's there, maybe I don't know what their breeding is, I can just get my phone out, type their ear tag in, straight away I have all the information of that sheep readily available to me. So I can see instantly if it would fit in well with my flock or if the breeding was perhaps too close to my ram and it wouldn't be a sensible purchase. Um, the only challenge with this is that you need an internet connection for it to work. And of course, not all areas of our farm or all the markets we go to have very good internet connection. Um, in terms of more general day-to-day -day management, um, we are using the app on the right, which is Herdwatch. We've been trialing that with our calves. We're also trialing um, our livestock with sheep, just to compare the two. We found these work really well. Um, they're actually based offline. You don't need an internet connection when you're out on the farm putting in your information. Then when you get back in the house and connect back to the Wi-Fi, it'll all upload and sort itself out, which works much better than needing the internet connection. And these day-to-day -day apps have been so good for just recording little extra bits of information that might be useful in the future, such as has a sheep had a lambing problem? Um, does a calf seem a little bit poorly one day? And that way I know I can pull up an individual animal on my phone and have all of those bits of information that would have easily got lost in the, the reams of paperwork that I would have had before. So we're really looking at expanding the use of these day-to-day -day management tools just to try and make things a bit more efficient and more easy to follow. Um, finally, talking about uh, women in agricultural careers. So my own journey, um, I decided I was going to make agriculture my career in my late teens. I went on to university, did my master's at Harper Adams, and I um, had a very positive university experience. I didn't feel at a disadvantage from being a female. And the number of girls signing up to agricultural courses in England has steadily been rising. A university in Wales, Aberystwyth, actually had more females than males on their agricultural course this year, which I just think is brilliant. However, I think there is a massive gap in trying to get females from non-farming backgrounds 
obviously I already knew about all the amazing opportunities in agriculture because I've grown up in it. However, um, children from non-farming backgrounds, I don't think they realise all the different possible career options they are within agriculture, from out in the farm to doing tech behind the scenes to management, livestock crops, there's just so much information out there that they don't have access to. So um, three key points I would like to see more of to help encourage more people into agriculture and females particularly, is more agricultural education in secondary schools, uh, more informed careers advisors and better career guidance for students and access to work experience so people can actually get out and try these different careers and see what engages them. Um, so yeah, thank you very much for listening to my story. Anita, thank you very, very much for that. It was really, really informative. I know my son would certainly be mad to meet you. He's really very, very keen on the Kerry Hills. So he'd absolutely love to meet you. And we'll be following you on Facebook from today going <laughs> forward. Um, but some really, really interesting uh, points made by yourself. Thank you very, very much. Well done. Um, Elizabeth and Paul, welcome. Um, I see you've just put some messages there into the chat. Uh, so again, just to encourage people just to put where they're from, the country that they're in residence today. Um, and also if you're a farmer or if you're from a farming organisation or, or a company. So moving um, on then um, to um, Matus uh, Kiora, sorry, um, he is a beekeeper in Poland and at the age of 29 Matus took over from running his professional apiary farm um, from his uh, father several years ago. They have 600 hives in total and transport all of the hives to various crops so that they can obtain honey throughout the season. Today, Matus will give us an overview of himself and the apiary farm, his experiences in being a young farmer and working with his father in farm succession, and his presentation today is creating a buzz in agriculture. Matus. Okay, thank you, Hazel. I will show my screen now. Okay, I hope it's good for everybody. Welcome, everybody. Uh, my name is Mateusz Sikoja. I live in Opalenica in Poland. I'm a beekeeper in our family apiary. Our farm is one of the largest in the region. Okay, one moment. Okay. My father, Marian, began a development of the apiary in 1950s. It was his main occupation from the very beginning. The beginnings were not easy because my father had to make most of the devices himself, such as beehives or honey extractors. Through the years, uh, the main product of our apiary changed from royal jelly to honey in the late 80s. I, in, in 1998, I started to work with my father. Initially, I had to combine work with bees with high school education and studies. In the meantime, we started a great modernization of the apiary by replacing practic practically all machines. All equipment such as honey extractors, honey pumps, and equipment needed for filtration of the honey had to be made of stainless steel. Uh, we also changed the hives. The old wooden ones have been replaced by polystyrene ones, which are much more lighter and resistant to the weather. It is easier to keep them clean, thanks to which the bees live in more hygienic conditions. Continues. The development of our apiary led us to the level of 600 hives in 2021. We transport all the hives to currently flowering plants up to 300 kilometers from home. The main plants for which we transport the hives are rape, acacia, linden and buckwheat. Every year we breed new queens for all hives in the apiary, which guarantees high hive efficiency and good health of the colony. In the year 2000, we used all cars, all cars which transported a total of 50 hives. It took a long time to relocate over 400 hives. Currently, we can transport up to 152 beehives, beehives at the time in help of three cars with trailers. In addition, we mechanized the loading of hives by purchasing a mini loader. Loading is no longer manual, and it is possible to load the hives by even one person, which makes us independent from additional employees. 
the technology we use consists of camera traps that allows basic weather monitoring such as temperature. They are also very helpful, help, helpful in protecting the apiary from both human and wild animals. Camera photos allow us to check if the beehives have fallen over due to strong winds. As you can see, there's a thief who was trying to steal our hives, but unfortunately he, he managed to escape before the police arrived, but luckily he abandoned the hives. Uh, we use a drone that provides great marketing images. It also helps in planning the arrangement of the apiary in the fields. We control the area in search of other apiaries to prevent conflicts with other beekeepers. Our apiary takes part in the Demeter pilot. We installed a control beam monitor, which is the central unit of the system consisting of sensors in 25 hives. Sensors monitor the temperature inside the hive, which allows the remote assessment of the condition of the bee colony. In addition, the sensors are sensitive to shock, which allows us to receive alarms if someone opens the hive or it falls over for some reason. In my case, the farm succession is a very long process. When I started working, I was helping my father. Now the roles have changed. Whenever he can, he goes with us to the apiary and suggests what else can be done better. Family farming allows learning from experience, which is much more effective than purely theoretical approach. When working with bees, each year is different. Late springs, temperature fluctuations, dry or humid weather require from the keeper to adapt and act quickly to prevent problems. New technologies significantly simplify the work. Thanks to sensors in the hives and cameras, we can reduce concerns about mobility of the apiary. Encouraging young people to beekeeping is a very interesting activity. I'm often invited to kindergarten or school to tell children about the life of bees. Children are very curious about the work of a beekeeper and actively participate in meetings. Many people are surprised that beekeeping can be a profession, not just a hobby. Fortunately, the perception of beekeeping is changing and people are increasingly seeing the important role bees play in the environment. Thank you for sharing my story. Just thank you very, very much. Really, really interesting how you actually use one technology for two completely different services, such as the drones for both marketing and also for the arrangement of the hives, hives as well. Um, thank you very, very much for your, for your um, presentation today. It was, it was really very insightful. Thank you. So we'll move along to uh, Diana Lenzi. Um, in June 2021, Diana was elected president of CEJA of the European Council of Young Farmers. Uh, Diana herself is a young farmer in Tuscany and since 2008 she manages her family's winery. She cultivates and processes grapes to make Chianti Classico wines, olives for Evo and ancient grains of flour, or sorry, for flour and pasta. Diana has been involved and active in um, Confagri culture since 2012 and she has been president at the regional uh, level and vice president at the national level since, 2020, so since 2019. Today Diana will discuss the challenges for young and female farmers and what is needed at policy level to ensure the voice of the young and female farmers are heard. Diana? Hi, um, good morning to everyone. Yes, uh, I get to put uh, my story a little bit into perspective and what I have been uh, seeing at EU level in uh, these first six months as president of, of SEJA. Um, what I really think is very important to start understanding um, is that we really need a strategy for generational renewal. Um, the numbers that were presented at the beginning, I find very dramatic. The fact that only 11% of farms in the EU in 2016 was run by under someone under the age of 40 really should put a spotlight on the fact that right now we are on the threshold of a, a very big revolution, a huge change, uh, grand ambitions for the farming sector, yet we really don't have uh, enough arms to carry on this transition to really succeed in all of the big uh, and, and very noble objectives that are being uh, laid on the table to make agriculture more sustainable. Um, 
someone the other day actually flipped the number around and it made it even scarier. It means that 89% of farms are instead run by someone who isn't young. So, and who isn't, uh, who is slowly has somehow transitioning to the, to the end uh, of their career in farming. So we, I really believe that policymakers at EU level should uh, start strategizing, so should start really understanding that there is a need for consistent policies, for overall policies at national and EU level that can help this uh, transition. And there really needs to be a desire to and an ambition to drive this change. Because I was reading a document from 1983 the other day, the year I was born, uh, and it was a petition of MEPs to, to the council encouraging the council to take action on generational renewal. And the challenges that were highlighted were the speech, this petition, I could have written it yesterday. Nothing has changed, nothing has really been tackled. The problems that were there in 1983, access to land, access to finance, access to knowledge and skills are exactly the ones that we see today as our traditional roadblocks. Um, where does it all start? Um, it starts in making agriculture attractive. It means showing the new face of agriculture. And I must say, I was very inspired by both the speakers before me because they really embody everything that I believe is the new agriculture. It's smart, it's skillful, it uh, it's goes beyond what uh, we know or what we've always considered agriculture as uh, in traditionally. It uses technology and it uses science in its favor um, to be more ambitious, to be uh, more present on the market, to use digital skills, to use Facebook, to, to communicate uh, sheep. It, it, it's genius. And that is what should be shown. Um, sharing successful stories like this is the most powerful message that we can bring. Um, but to make agriculture attractive, we really need to make it profitable. And that I think is the one um, big issue that no matter what we, no matter what policy we put in place, where may it be the cap, the cap of the origins, the cap of 92, the cap of 2003, we've never managed to really make uh, agriculture profitable. We've never managed to make sure that farmers could make a decent uh, living off of their work. And I really feel this is one of the things that scares uh, the older generation right now in the succession schemes. The fact that the profitability of farms is even more endangered now with the great change that is requested. If we're going to be shifting our production methods towards more sustainable ones, it will probably require grand investments at farm level. And Farms are already struggling today in their profitability. So the capacity of also investing in change is very hard, which is why, again, in the whole idea of a strategy towards generational renewal, uh, putting into um, place policies that can help investment schemes for young farmers who can take all of those ambitious projects, all of those uh, new um drivers that are really coming out from, from the younger generation that sees uh, the potential and that wants to invest in change, well, they will probably need um, schemes that can help their investment along the way. Uh, and, and this is not about changing the way that we, uh, for example, put the lump sum for first installation aid. It's a much more continuous type of, uh, I think, that of investment that we need to, to consider. Business plans in nature have a much different timing compared to other um, sectors. And uh, I think it's fundamental that we really take into consideration the uniqueness of farming, the diversity of farming, and the uniqueness and the diversity of young people who are putting their future at stake and want to invest in farming. Um, so I don't know how we are on... <laughs> time. I, I'm not sure if I, I can still say a few things, uh, but most definitely I think that it is, it is time that uh, national policies and EU policies start taking into consideration what needs to be done to empower a new generation, to attract a new generation. And it starts in schools, it starts in technical institutions, it starts showing 
the, the change, it starts driving the change and giving the possibility for new business models to become the new uh, system in which agriculture uh, succeeds. Great, Diana, thank you very, very much. Really, really interesting. And like you, I, I find the other two presentations really quite inspirational. And I think there has been that drive um, of agricultural farmers towards technology. And that drive has been, the move to technology has been the move to, to move their bottom line as such, but yet their profitability is, is still very much endangered. So thank you very, very much for that. Um, we are going to move now to our Mentimeter um, and uh, we're going to take some time just to answer some questions. So I think Margot is going to, our technical support is actually going to share this with you. And um, so first of all, um, you can either use the QR code to actually log in to menti.com um, or you can use menti.com and use the code to actually access it and then enter the code then 51415568. Um, we might actually put that code into the chat as well, Margot, if you wouldn't mind, just in case. Um, and then we'll move on in a moment. Uh, we'll just give everybody a quick moment. I can see people are logging on bottom. Actually, I'll just put the code into the chat. Uh, myself. So just give everybody a moment to log in to menti.com. Okay, and you just put in your code to vote. Please do take the time to do this this morning. It will be absolutely brilliant to get feedback from people on the questions that we have. And we are hoping to, to publish a report after this event. So we'll start. Um, and again, just for those, um, again, you can log on to menti.com and actually insert the code 51415568. So the first question, it's about ranking. What has been the biggest challenge faced in your career in food and agriculture? Okay. And the options are investment to adopt technologies, rising costs, lower prices for produce, and maintaining work-life balance, facing competition from other farmers outside of the EU, getting training on new farming techniques, new regulations, environmental rulings. It's interesting to see that number one is the, the rising cost. Oh, it's just been pipped. <laughs> the rising costs, uh, lower prices for produce. Okay. Investment in, in to adopt digital technologies is also quite interesting as well as uh, Diane and I were both saying that the actual adoption of technologies, um, it's been noted that it's to try and actually affect the bottom line for farmers, um, but yet their profitability is still um, being affected. My apologies if you see me looking this way, it's actually to another screen as well. So, so we'll move on um, maybe to the next question. Um, and this is multiple choice. Um, have you experienced harassment working in agriculture? So yes, verbal, yes, sexual, yes, online, yes, physical. It's great to see that the highest ranking number is no, which is fantastic. Again, what we might do in the next one is just understand a little bit um, the, those lower percentages that if it's yes, what was the main cause of that particular harassment? And this is a word cloud. So you just type in one individual word and it will just actually appear here.
social skills. Jealousy is quite interesting as well. I'm just wondering, and um, maybe if um, if we could expand a little bit, maybe on jealousy, whether it's to do with the ownership of the land or whether it's to do with the fact that maybe you've uh, got a college degree. Um, in addition, competition. We'll move along then to the next question as well. Are women and young people well represented in the agri-food sector? Huge majority are saying no. <clears throat> Yes, it's creeping in there a little bit. It's interesting to see that the large percentage is no, but yes, was creeping in. Again, I suppose just from my own experience over the last number of years, I would have seen an incline in women across uh, the agri-food sector, which has just been great. And then also it probably um, goes back to what Philippi, Philippa was saying with regards to the number of females that are enlisting in college as well, which is really, really good. So hopefully that number will climb. We'll move on then to the next question. <clears throat> How can we ensure women and young people are better represented in the agri-food sector? And again, this is a word cloud, so you can put in three words for a participant as opposed to just one. leadership opportunities, education is very much coming to the fore, training and funding, group support, which is really quite interesting as well, equal salaries, more stories, more awareness. Fighting gender bias, really interesting. Education just stays right at the top, which I think is really quite interesting. And again, it's a good reflection of uh, what uh, both Diana and Philip were saying earlier on. So we'll move along then to the next um, question. What do you think is most needed to attract young people to farming? Pick one. Financial support, collaborative work, training on new technologies, ongoing knowledge improvement, better knowledge transfer, work-life balance, which um, I, I live on a farm, I grew up on a farm, I think work-life balance is key improved rural infrastructure, more job opportunities and uh, better policies and regulations. Financial support is really coming to the fore there. Very large transfer as well. Great, that's perfect. Thank you very much. We might move along and see if we have any questions um, from the audience in relation to Philippa, Diane's or Matisse's presentations. I'm just scrolling back over any of the chats so if anybody can So yes, uh, Elizabeth, we can provide you with more information and resources on uh, regenerative farming. And um, you can also follow the Smart Agri Hubs uh, project and portal. You can uh, register there as well. Um, and there's lots of information on smartagrihubs.eu. Welcome, Alicia, from the Demeter project, uh, working on one of the pilots there. Um, Hazel, we have one question from Paul Delange. Uh, could you read it out, um, Margaret? Yes, of, of course, or maybe Paul, if you want to speak, you can unmute yourself also. Yeah, sure. 
I was just sort of thinking out loud and wondering what the role of the networks that we are actually defining this very moment as the mater and smart. Uh, 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 every hub, what the the role and the, and the sort of opportunity that we have as a network. What what can we do? Uh, um, I feel like. One of the things that we saw pop up in the word, word cloud was also raising awareness and 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 changing the story and narrative of of farming to attract local young farmers. What can the role of of uh, of the networks that that are, are coming together today be instead of um, you know waiting for regulations from higher hand? What what can we already start doing? today. Diana, do you, would you like to take that? Uh, that is a very good question. Um, and I think that actually events like this are really kind of the first step of something that needs to be scaled up. Um, in my experience, peer-to-peer -peer knowledge and finding uh, solidarity between farmers has been my biggest driver in bringing me where I am here today. Uh, when we started, when we created the, the Sezione, the little group of Anga in, in Siena, there was just six of us, but it was six young farmers who were living in kind of remote, isolated uh, areas with their head in, in their farm, completely kind of stuck even in their problems. Uh, by getting to know each other and then becoming 12, 18, 24, then knowing the national uh, other representatives, it really gave me the sense that even if farming sometimes is a very kind of lonely uh, activity because you're in your remote area, instead there's a huge network of people who are dealing with the same problems, finding solutions, willing to share those solutions, finding ways to create, uh, sometimes even uh, like building up on their problems solutions. So finding... Uh, inspiring stories, practical problems uh, being solved, what was for me of great inspiration. And when I got to bring this at an EU level and seeing in my network with Seja, 33 young farmers associations from all over Europe, that was the, the most inspiring moment of, of my life. It's then what, what led me to, to run. And so I think like, mentoring programs, leadership programs that create fellowships, that create uh, <laughs> farmer pen pals. I don't know. We, we have so many now digital instruments that could really help us in this that uh, I think that using what can be one inspiring story to inspire others doesn't mean that other people will follow exactly your path or will copy your business model, but they might just find that that strength within themselves that they need to then find their way to 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 make it through and um so i really believe that the power of networks is uh, what will really solve what policy is not willing to solve great th thank you diana okay thank you so much Diana. there's another question here what's the initiative for low-income people to grow up with technology for agricultural improvement would anybody like to take that? Are there any initiatives that you're aware of, Diana, for low-income farmers? Not that I am aware of. Um, mm -hmm. It is one of the big problems. It's something I would have liked to say in my speech. Uh, what we, what the other big thing that was never really tackled at the same time with generational renewal was really investing in rural areas. And the fact that rural areas are instead are becoming more and more deserted and so are creating less opportunities and are um, increasing the problem of low income for certain areas is, is dramatic. So I think that at the same time, the other thing we need to is an integrated strategy for the redevelopment of rural areas, bringing services that are necessary for young people to want to stay in those areas. Because right now, uh, we... we People who, who grow up in a rural area really find uh, their biggest dream is to, to leave and to find opportunities uh, elsewhere. Well, instead, there can be so many opportunities that grow around a profitable farm that recreate a, a striving economy in rural areas. 
And so even those low income farmers could find uh, the problem, I, I think, could be exceeded by the solution uh, of recreating a, a more striving economy in, in rural areas. Uh, but most definitely, I know that there are at national level through farmers organizations, a lot of mutual funds for your uh, farmers. And it's also one of the ways that risk management is now being dealt uh, by many uh, farmers associations to help uh, kind of create solidarity schemes for farmers who are having trouble normally after a climatic disaster. Great, thank you, Diana. Just one quick question to Philippa or to Matus. Um, I know sometimes for low income farmers, sometimes they overlook some of the technologies that they use. As an example, a technology within their own hand is in their phone. I know, uh, Philippa, you had mentioned about kind of, we have it here in Ireland called Dundeal, how you act, or even Facebook, something that's actually readily free to them. And I suppose from your um, expertise, Matus, maybe it's the actual, the equipment that you're purchasing um, to actually move the hives or, or different pieces like that, that might be, it's technology, I suppose, that sometimes farmers have on a daily basis, but at the same time, they, they, they have it so frequently that they actually don't even consider it to be technology anymore. Uh, what would you think of that, Philippa or, or Matus, like from a low income farmer perspective, that sometimes they have technology that they don't actually categorize as technology any longer? Um, yes, probably. I'd say that when trying to think for my presentation, what technology do I use? I didn't think of mentioning Facebook for ages because it is just something we're all so familiar with. It's just there on our phones all the time. Um, but definitely, I think if people step back and try and think what's an everyday thing I can tap into and use to try and, and get something out of it, because um, like we're, we're a low income farm, we can't afford to go and spend thousands on some great, really good fancy tech, but we can still get some really useful benefits from just simple everyday free to access stuff that can make a big difference to businesses, definitely. Thank you very much, Felipe. We might move along to the next um, uh, set of uh, presenters. Thank you so much, uh, Diana, Matus and Philippa. It was really, really interesting today. Thank you. So we're going to move along to the farm advisor, Anika Span. So Anika is a project expert um, in food security and health for ZLTO in the Netherlands. She obtained her master's degree in both animal science and applied communication science at Wageningen University. And for the past two and a half years, she's been working at ZELTO, a farmers association, as a project manager in the field of sustainable livestock farming and animal health. She's currently mainly engaged in supporting livestock farmers and reducing antibiotic use and improving biosecurity on farms. Today, she'll give an overview of her role as a farm advisor, sharing knowledge and encouraging young and female farmers. And she'll discuss any biases that she has found as a female farm advisor herself. Annika? Yes, thank you, Hazel. I will share my presentation. Okay, uh, hello everybody. My name is Annick Spaans, as Hazel said, and I will share my uh, experience as a farm advisor and in specifically my experience about the implementation of technologies on farm level. Sorry, right, Annika, could you change your uh, presentation to presenter mode, if you wouldn't mind? We can see your slides on the left. Is that okay? I think you change it through view. Maybe. Yeah, it is already on presenter mode. Oh, sorry, my apologies. Okay, perfect. Yeah? Okay, okay. <laughs> Well, um, as a project manager uh, on Z at ZLTO, I am mainly involved in innovation support at farm, farm level. So I am doing some uh, fac facilitation on knowledge exchange uh, to the farmers and their vet veterinarians and advisors. And I'm mainly working, uh, organizing group discussions, farm visits and coaching projects. And in this, uh, quite often I introduce new technologies to farmers. And in addition, I'm a member of Young Euphras, which is a, young, uh, a network of young advisors, and I will tell you a bit more about this later. So my experience being a young female farm advisor, um, when I am entering a, a farm, um, most of the time the farmers are positively su surprised and uh, after some chit chat, there's soon an equal relationship. So in general, I think there is is it still visible? Yes, uh, it is. I'm sharing your slide currently. So you're on the third slide, right? Yeah. Perfect. So 
Um, in general, I think there is um, uh, no bias found in the farmer advisor relationship. But sometimes I do feel that I'm a bit behind because um, I have the feeling I need to prove myself being a young female farm advisor. But um, well, that soon that becomes uh, fine. I think a more important challenge over here being a young advisor is to get enough space from your organization just to grow and to de develop to find your personal goals. Because when you are young and just starting starting in the field, uh, it's quite often not that clear and. Quite quickly, it is all about uh, commercial goals and making money in an organization. So I think that's a major challenge when you are starting as a young advisor. Then something about how I experience technology and farmers in practice. Um, in my experience, there is much interest in technology, especially among the young farmers. Uh, they think it uh, contributes to a work relief better control of the farm and an improved work life balance and uh, they get to know a lot about these technologies through the internet newspapers and exchange with fellow farmers and how i experience the technology is that it actually enters a farm quite gradually and unconsciously uh, for example with a tractor ventilation or a milking robot they're having updates and ongoing developments so um yeah on a grad gradually, it's, it's, it is improved. So to introduce technology to the farm, I think an adv advisor is not that essential. However, um, technology is of course not that easy at a cease. And I think there is a pitfall with the farmers and of course I'm exaggerating a bit over here, but this technology solves all my work and problems. It's um, in, they think that it works like that, but I think the advisor plays over here an important role because technology, of course, is not the complete solution and it does not take over all of the work. Observing the animals remains essential as they are living creatures and it is important to keep attention to the details and to the remaining work about the animals, but also if the technology is working properly. And also another role of an advisor is to demonstrate all the pros and cons of a technology and what's about the payback period. The farmers are interested in this to know that and uh, they're expecting from an advisor that they can tell it to them. So about the pitfall I just mentioned, I would like to give you some examples. Um, yeah, well, what I and my colleagues experienced in the, in the field was, for example, with the heat detection sensors of the dairy cattle. Because then they get a notification of behavior change, but still the farmer needs to visit the cow and check and react properly. So that's still important to do us as a farmer. Um, and another example is in a high-tech dairy farm. And suddenly they had a lo very low nail yield. What turned out was that the ventilation controller had a leakage current. While the technology did what it was supposed to do, uh, the cows couldn't cope with the electricity. So there it turned out that it's in important to look at the details and it, if everything is working well. And the last example is about a, a high-tech pig farm in which there was suddenly a low growth in the piglets. And over there, it turned out that one of the two feed mix mixers had an undeclared malfunction, causing the piglets to be fed less than normal. So again, uh, paying attention to the technology and the details remains important, and also to look at the animals. So happily, I do see uh, some developments in the fields to encourage youth and females into farming and also to adopt technology. And over here, I have some examples. Uh, for example, the project of i to connect that is organizing some summer schools about being an interactive innovation support advisor. And I do also see more and more testimonials and videos to see how other farmers are doing it, uh, also to inspire the, the young, young people. And uh, from, my, uh, from the UFRES network, uh, we are currently thinking about organizing a mentorship program together with YPART, in which uh, young advisors are being educated and trained with the aid of, uh, of mentors, actually, as we are uh, discussed in our previous discussion. And lastly, also online platforms, just like Fairshare and Eureka, 
I think that are very interested, interesting platforms to, to have as a young advisor, but also to inspire other uh, young uh, female advisors and farmers as well. Over here, I do think there's a challenge that um, we are developing very, very nice ideas on European level, but how to, uh, to communicate it to, to the farm level remains a challenge. Like we are discussing in uh, a few minutes ago, um, if a farm is very isolated, how do they get known of these different kinds of initiatives? Because we are doing so many interesting things, but we need to to uh, it needs to be landed on on farm level. So my conclusions are that the technology enters the farm quite automatically. And in this, the farmers play an important role in making farmers aware of the remaining work when implementing our technology. Think about the details and about the animals as living creatures. Happily, there are initiatives to encourage youth and farmers, uh, females into farming and to adopt technology, which is more and more present. But there's a need to collaborate and communicate from European level to farm level, I think. And I would like to end my presentation with the quote that the men are doing the tough work while the women are having the eye, eye for details. So this is also very important and essential with the application of the new technologies. And yeah. thank you very, very much. Really, really interesting presentation. And I really like the idea, as you quite rightly said, the technology is not a 100% solution. The technology supports the farmer, but the farmer has to support the technology as well. Really, very interesting. Thank you very, very much, Annika. And um, so we'll move along to our next presenter, um, Christina. Um, I'm not even going to try to pronounce Christina's surname. I've already apologized to her in advance for this. Um, but Christina is the director and the coordinator of the Digital Innovation Hub Agri-Food Lithuania. And she's an international digitalization expert with more than 12 years experience um, in product R&D and innovation management, developing ICT products on a cross sectorial basis. Her scientific interest evaluates the efficiencies of the industry's twin transition in the EU, and she promotes clusters and digital innovation hubs in close collaboration with transforming sectors. Today, she'll explain what a DIH is and their role in diffusing information and her experience in leading a digital innovation um, as a female. Christina. Thank you so much. Thank you, Hazel, so much for such a nice presentation of myself. So as I was introduced, I'm Christina Shermukshnita Leshunena. And today I was invited and for me it's a huge honor to be here and try to explain what actually digital innovation hubs are. We've heard uh, the question how actually different networks can help. So uh, first, I'm going to be explaining how organizations, which are already based on the national levels, can help and why we need those broad networks. Also, I'll try to answer this uh, today and then talk a little bit about women leadership in the agri-food sector. So basically, what is Digital Innovation Hub? Uh, organizations were created by European Commission Initiative in 2016, so uh, I'm sorry, in 2019, so those are quite young organizations, but they have very clear objective. They are performing and they are one-stop shop in providing all the information, all the means, uh, different schemes on how sectors should be transforming, going for the digital and Green Deal objectives transformation. First of all, helping in digital journey, journey for all the sectors. So Agri-Food Lithuania, we are sectorial digital innovation hubs and probably you could find on your national levers in different member st states, also different sectorial, uh, um, sectorial digital innovation hubs, uh, which unite uh, different stakeholders and act as a one-stop shop. So what do I mean by one-stop shop? If we look what, act, uh, what digital innovation hubs do, they are actually orchestrators. They are creating ecosystems around them. So in our case, we are creating innovative uh, ecosystem, uniting all the stakeholders on the food supply chain, starting the primary production mm -hmm. and going uh, uh, for them even to the end consumers, uniting 
and collaborating all together. So under our roof, we have different scientific institutions. Uh, we are creating startup ecosystem. We are working very closely with the SMEs, large enterprises. We have as a members clusters, which unite different businesses. Uh, we have governmental institutions. We have, of course, investors, different uh, funding agencies, uh, associations. And what digital innovation hubs do, what kind of services they provide? If we look very quickly, there are four types of different services. Those are test before invest. This is very important part. So that's where different activities from um, uh, demonstrating different uh, technologies, from demonstrating different pilots, uh, going to the services if, uh, if, for example, farmer comes and says, says what, uh, what kind of technologies do I need? Or where can I look at the newest ones just before investing? So this is the place to come and try maybe already see some technologies at work or try to get the funding to establish such test beds. Another part of the services, which are very important, that's for the upskilling, reskilling, and gaining new competences. So with the twin transition, we know, we've heard already, there are many challenges. And what is most important, all the challenges are the same on in all the countries. There is no exceptions. So uh, we are actually all together as a community solving the same challenges. And uh, for everyone to transform, to go for the digital way, uh, we need to remember that we need uh, new competences, we need upskilling, we need reskilling. So these organizations also, they work very closely with the universities, that's what we do, with the institutions, colleges, uh, consultancy agencies, in order to bring the needs which we feel what are in the market, and help those needs to be fulfilled and to come back to the farmers and say, okay, there are those new programs. Uh, you can come, you can learn, you can uh, uh, get your employees with, with the new skills and etc. And of course, another very important part, I think Diana was mentioning, that's already bringing new programs to the schools, to the universities, which are uh, not only showing that the att attractiveness of the agriculture, but also provide those young people, young kids, young students with their future skills, which are going to be in need. Another part of the very important services, as I said before, that's creating the healthy ecosystem for the startups. This is another very important part. That's where you can come and say, okay, look, I have an idea. Uh, I am a startup, or I just have an idea. Uh, what can I do with it? So these are the organizations which should help you with your journey, with your ideas. For example, uh, give you advice or uh, introduce you to the investors or introduce you to the mentors. Um, for example, AgriFood Lithuania, we are organizing tons of different hackathons, mentorships and, and, and uh, similar activities where you can just come with the plain idea, being just a student and just start from the scratch and maybe finish with some already commercialized product. So, this is also the place to be. And the fourth very important service, that's networking. So this is uh, going back to that question, what, what could be done with the networks right now, uh, not waiting for the special invitations. So we are the organizations which communicate, raise the awareness of new funding, of new events, of new happening, new innovations, new technologies on the national level. On the other hand, we are part and very active on EU level uh, networks because we can bring the knowledge from here. Like, uh, for example, like in such uh, events like today, we are uh, exchanging the knowledge and I'll be coming back to my farmers in Lithuania and bringing them uh, the new, uh, the new uh, information, what I've heard here today. And only by communicating with each other, acting as a one community, then we can achieve 
something uh, miraculous, as I say. These are just very short examples that I want to present what we actually do. And one of the most important projects, which is started in Lithuania last year, that's empowering women in agri-food. Um, I was a role model or the face of this project in Lithuania. And we worked with the women, encouraging them to come into agriculture, just also the idea to work with the for the half of the year and then finish with minimal viable product or even to go commercialize with their products. Uh, and this initiative came from uh, European Innovation and Technology, Technology Institute, uh, Eight Food. Also, we are organizing the biggest agri-food forum in Baltic states. We are organizing, as I said, many hackathons. Uh, and in all those cases, which is very important, we are attracting not only stakeholders from the agri-food sector, but we are working very closely with other sectors. This is another thing which is very important. We can uh, do the cross-sectorial collaboration and bring the knowledge from, from other sectors. And coming back a little bit on the women's side, because I'm running out of the time, I see um, very, very important, I agree, if we talk on EU level about the population of regions. So uh, many researchers show, and this is very clear, that in order to bring people back into regions, what is needed, that's young people coming back, and women coming back because, well, it's obvious women are also like a little orchestrators in creating ecosystems around them. Of course, children, families, and etc. And young people are those people who have new ideas, uh, brand new uh, way of thinking. So they need to come back and see. And I strongly agree what we need to do right now that's help agriculture change its uh, face to show that it's very valuable, reliable, to bring, to raise its reputation up, that it is one of the priority sectors in, in whole EU. And it is very, uh, it, it brings lots of different opportunities. So this is very important. And for my ending, just a quick look and into the a screen. So you see my little deer, which comes every morning and eats uh, next to my house. And every morning it is beating its head into the window. So my wish is, please, let's not fight with imaginable enemies. Let's not fight the change. Let's try to unite together as a community and let's change. For once, the face of the agriculture, inviting everyone to come. Other sectors, young people, women, and only then we're going to achieve a uh, really good change. Thank you for your attention. Christina, thank you very, very much for that. I, I love the little video at the end and the, the, the little story around it. Um, and it's great to see that, as you quite rightly said, you know, women are natural kind of networkers. So for digital innovation hubs and networks around this, you know, females should be uh, leading the way. Um, our next presenter today is Ethan Cleary from the Irish Farmers Association. He comes from a fifth generation arable farm and is passionate about connecting agriculture with technology that benefits and supports farmers. He's currently the Irish Farmers Association Technology and Innovation Executive, responsible for the association's overall technology development. From a policy perspective, his current focus is driving the innovation and digital agenda for Irish farmers at an EU and national level with the aim of ensuring farmers benefit from this era of rapid digital transformation. Today, he will explain how farmers associations play a critical role in encouraging young farmers and females in the sector. Ethan. Thanks very much, Hazel. I'm just uh, going to launch my presentation now. So I'm just conscious of time. So I'm gonna do a bit of a whistle stop tour um, to what we're doing from a policy perspective and how important and critical it is. Um, so bear me one sec. Okay, so um, I work for the Irish Farmers Association um, where I am in charge of product development and technology policy and increasingly diversity is playing a stronger and stronger role in how I think about things from how we develop you know, system-based solutions and then how we actually try and create broad-based policy to be inclusive and be accessible for everybody. 
And the IFA is the largest farming representative organization in the country of Ireland. We look after um, all types of farmers and represent all types of farmers from all types of backgrounds and income streams and you know, different commodity sectors as well. It's a democratic organization uh, and organized in branches uh, and farmers are our leaders and they drive what we do. And um, back in 2017, uh, one at part of the organization started looking at diversity and seeing what we could do to try and increase the participation from farmers out there that you know, might have a different voice or a different view because we know it makes good business sense, it improves levels of innovation, it leads to better performing teams, it improves the quality of service, it reflects the membership that's out there that is increasingly diverse and improves the talent pool that, that, that's available and that can be used to help drive agriculture forward. So you can see the short URL there if you want to check out the report in full. So as part of this uh, program of work, there is a diversity study carried out and kind of three of the big uh, kind of, uh, I suppose, elements that stood out to me were the lack of time uh, for people uh, available to get involved in the association, the lack of confidence in their skills and the lack of accessibility and availability of training. So at the same time, I was looking at what we could do around digital inclusion. How could we drive further adoption on farms uh, and to increase the, the capabilities that are there and for people to make the most out of their farm business? And we know that in this era of kind of rapid digital transformation, that we can't leave anybody behind. We need every farmer and every person to have access to skills that allows them to participate regardless of their experience or background. And that's going to become increasingly important as more and more jobs across the entire economy require digitalization to be, to be a core part of what we do. Uh, and that means we need to look at how we get people to participate from starting from very low or very no level of, of digital exposure or skills. And then how can we harness the, the actual digital transformation and technologies out there to increase productivity and to help drive business uh, transformation? So one part of this, it's been very important, is understanding that maybe there is no policy in place from a national or from a EU level. So what can you do then to actually drive that? And then working with the existing policy instruments and actors that are there to try and make sure that it's as aligned as possible to the benefits of farmers and agriculture as a whole. So I'm just going to briefly go through maybe three or four of the, of the kind of policy areas where we've been working on in the last two years. Um, Skillnet Ireland, which... You, are very crucial and critical, especially um, the mention in our national, our strategic plan for the common agricultural policy. One program of work was explicitly mentioned in that. The National Economic and Social Council, which are key advisors to the Irish Prime Minister. Our national digital strategy in Ireland, which was only launched a couple of weeks back. And then, as I mentioned, the common agricultural policy and some other agri-food strategies as well. So Farm Business Skillnet is, is a part of Skillnet Ireland, which is the, the national training agency, which is, it gets funding from our Department of Education and Skills. There are 60 networks in total and Farm Business Skillnet is one of them. And the role within Farm Business Skillnet is to provide high impact and relevant training uh, so farmers can develop their skills uh, across a load of different areas, such as leadership and management, finance, risk management, IT, practical skills. Um, back in 2019, there was a call for funding, an additional call for funding from Skillnet Ireland. And we thought this was a great opportunity for us to understand really what's happening in terms of digital adoption on farms. What are the barriers? What can we learn from people that are currently using digital technology in a really pervasive way? And what is the awareness uh, of people around the benefits of this? It's something that's come up. We saw in our Mentimeter poll as well. You know, what can you derive in terms of the, the, the return on investment from the adoption of these digital technologies? So some of the key um, kind of findings and recommendations from the research we carried out, and this, if you remember back to what we were looking at within the diversity report and the diversity research, you know, increasing the availability of time to help better decision making, customised training for the specific needs of people there, collaboration and support, social learning, peer to peer, peer to peer learning, as we mentioned a few times uh, on, on the presentations today, and it's absolutely critical. It's, it's a key mode of how farmers educate and, and learn together. Um, one of the other findings from this was digital skills development. How can we create the model, not only for farmers, regardless of their digital experience, so they can get on the, the ladder at any stage and find a course or a program that will work for them, but also for the actual entire agricultural ecosystem. How can we work together to make things easier for people to avail of digital skills and digital technologies? 
So the four barriers, and this is pretty universal across, I suppose, all types of sectors or areas, you know, the ability to connect, the ability to access the devices and use the devices to make the most out of the, the internet, uh, the confidence. So, you know, if I'm going to do something, what's, what are the implications of it? Am I secure and safe? And what's happening with my data, which is a big issue that we keep hearing more and more about. And then skills and the motivation, like why should I use the internet? What, what's in it for me? What are the benefits? So with our National Economic Social Council, they had a report out in 2021, and we can see there's a direct mapping between the kind of barriers that we identified and the results from the research that they carried out. And then if we map their agenda for action, it very much mirrors and lines up to what we discover from our digital uh, agriculture research. If you look at our national digital strategy, which was you know, only launched a couple of weeks ago, and it wants to position Ireland as a digital leader, uh, driving and enabling transformation across the economy and society, including productivity-driven agriculture, you see the use of productivity there, higher yield per animal and hectare as being a key linchpin. And they've put these into four different buckets here, the digital transformation of business, the digitalization of public services, uh, the transition for digital skills across all parts of society, and then infrastructure as well, including the connected hubs and regional innovation networks, which is, you know, look at the work that's going on in smart agri-hubs and see how relevant that is. If you look at the mapping there, there is, again, direct kind of correlation between what we discover from our research and what's been found within the National Digital Strategy that was just published. Now, this is a, a pretty a dense slide, but I just want to demonstrate how this is actually transferring across to our common agricultural policy, national um, policy, national strategic plan. Uh, in particular, the structured program um, around digital adoption and agriculture, which has been developed by a lot of partners on this call today, including the Department of Agriculture, Chagas, the Walton Institute and ourselves and IFA. Um, so digital skills policy options, we need to look at new forms of learning. How, you know, COVID has changed how we interact with technology, not to leave people behind because prior recognition of knowledge and learning from the older approaches is, is equally as worthwhile and valid. How do we reach out to smaller farms and be more diverse in how we interact with people, localization of languages, uh, how can we increase and, and bring these people on board and then promote a target of training and advice. And I'll just leave you on one thing, it's the emerging challenges. So all this work has been done on, on the issues that we're currently facing, but we're seeing more and more people coming to us around farm data, what's happening, the assurances around it, the terms, conditions from schemes, interoperability, all these farm systems, how do they work together, uh, education, innovation networks, you know, attracting people back into rural locations, you know, what, what, what can we do to incentivize that? The connectivity and digital divide, and if we look at the work that Demeter is doing, especially around farm data interoperability and smart agri-hubs, I think we're on the right path with it. But there's just, uh, you know, there's a lot of more work to be done, but if we have to keep driving policy in order for us to make the, the real effective change. So thanks very much for, for listening to me. Um, any questions, you can fire away. Ethan, you hardly took a breath. Well done. <laughs> <laughs> what a presentation. We could just nearly give you a whole event to yourself. Amazing, amazing work that you've carried out over the last couple of years in Ireland and, and well done to you and the IFA on that. Um, we'll move along quickly to our Mentimeter. Um, I'm just, as Ethan quite rightly said, I'm conscious of time, but at the same time, I do have some questions uh, for Ethan, Christina and Eek, but we'll just do our Mentimeter first, just to try and get a, a feel of where people are at at the moment. So again, um, you'll have already been logged into your Mentimeter. And the first question is, do farmers need new skills to adopt digital technologies or just better technology solutions? both and better, better solutions are just coming in. We'll just allow people a little bit of additional time. I know there, um, Ethan had mentioned about skill nets and um, this year, over the last number of years, actually a number of digital innovation hubs, um, including our Department of Agriculture and the IFA came together actually to support skill nets in, in developing new training, which I thought was a really interesting way of finding a solution uh, across a number of different bodies. Um, and that was actually uh, published as part of a Smart Agri Hubs newsletter. So both, um, we'll move along to the next slide, which is a word cloud. So again, three uh, words per participant. What supports are most needed to encourage young and female farmers to use digital technologies? So we'll just give uh, people some time to, to think about this and to answer it.
training coming to the fore, cost-effective solutions, education, case studies. Training and education, they're coming to, to the fore again. So those, those three still remain the top education training and funding. Inclusive technology. That's quite interesting, actually, because I know one of our um, technologists internally is looking at um, how technologies are built and if the female is considered in building those technologies as well. So we might move along to the next question then, which is what's the most successful way to really achieve the knowledge and technology transfer in Tech Ireland? You can pick three here. So on-farm demonstrations, formal education, online forms, peer-to-peer -peer farm exchange, <coughs> excuse me, independent agricultural advisors, communities of practice, which is a group of people who share a common concern or an interest in a topic. It's really interesting, communities of practice and peer-to-peer -peer farming, which is exactly as Ethan had described and, and a number of, of our other pre uh, presenters had spoken about as well, and on-farm demonstrations. Perfect. We'll move along then to our next question, which is when do you think that the gender and generational gap will be filled, will be filled? Five years, 10 years, 15, 20 or never? So never in 20 years. I was hoping the time frame might be slightly less. But <laughs> Perfect. Okay. We'll um, we'll end our mentee uh, just there, um, and we'll move back just to see if anybody has any questions for Ethan, Christina, and Anik. I might actually put a question to Ethan if that's okay, and um, just while we're waiting for some of the questions to come in, um, and that's just to understand. Um, the impact, um, maybe Ethan, and, and, and also Anik and Christina as well, my apologies, I should be putting the question to all three of you, but had you noticed kind of um, an impact of COVID-19 when it came to kind of a gender impact, I suppose? Yeah, definitely. We've been seeing, we've seen increased participation across the board. Um, we were having 300 plus people joining online meetings at night, whereas maybe because of, you know, just people's personal situations, they wouldn't have been able to. We had people like farmers who would be in the middle of calving were able to actually use their smartphone to connect to a meeting and listen to people discuss key policy issues, as well as, you know, we might have specialized speakers talking about farm succession and that type of um that, those, that type of content so it's been a great leveler in that respect um in terms of anybody being able to attend access contribute so it it did speed everything up but the fact that we had done the research it gave us the confidence when the that the, the whole covid effect happened it gave us the confidence to be able to roll out with you know completely virtualizing the organization and it's because we had that data and belief in our members that we were able to do that. Fantastic, Ethan. Um, and Anika, I might put a question to you just with regards to um, the engagement of females maybe during COVID. Like, have you found that there's been a lot more engagement of female farmers across, you know, maybe there's more of a, a dual force coming to the fore that, you know, maybe their husband is farming, but they're actually participating in, as Ethan quite rightly said, these online forums and maybe engaging a little bit more in the farm now that they're working from home um, and also maybe uh, working alongside their husbands, which they do on a daily basis. I'm sure I've no doubt that they do, but I suppose I just wanted to ask that question as well. Well, I can answer a little bit. Well, um, during the COVID-19, actually what happened, it's not that uh, females uh, joined the farm, or, um, working at the farms more, but what happened actually, even those uh, female who were taking uh, parts as the leaders and leading uh, farms, companies, they actually 
went back into the family work. And that is what happened because during the COVID-19, you needed to take care of the kids, schooling, teaching. And that's what we were noticing at least. And we were talking around the community that um, in this case, for men, it basically did not change. So they stayed at the meetings and were participating, but women, they needed to go back into the family duties. So this is uh, again how we saw it actually was a, a step, a little step back. And um, now with the digital technologies, which we are already, already are getting used so much. So everything pretty much is falling back probably. And we're hoping that kids going to be staying at schools and, <laughs> and learning more. Um, and another thing what I really wanted to mention, for example, what COVID did, right? In 2019, for example, it's a overall statistics. Um, uh, actually, um, risk capital funds have reached their highest point of investing into the women startup, which made 2.8% overall investments in the whole world for the startups. And in 2020 and 2021, actually this number has dropped. So again, it has showed that COVID actually brought for, for, for women a, a little drawback. They, stay, they uh, overtook other duties and they stayed again uh, more with the families, not concentrating on the work, on the pitching, on providing their ideas or going more with, with the businesses. So great. We've just um, received one question in there it just to do with what is the policy to involve women in the agricultural sector for low income countries? Oh, I don't know. OK, okay. maybe Anik, you want to uh, add because I, I can talk. <laughs> uh, actually, uh, United Nations uh, has broad, broad way of different programs and they working very much with this goal to involve um, in the low income countries, women in the agri food sector, there are special funding schemes, there are special programs, uh, and there are special even forums talking for the whole world how to attract uh, females for the uh, for the farmers as a leaders, for example, because right now in the lower income countries in agriculture, particularly, women are working with the lower paid jobs or they're doing the hardest jobs, which is uh, sounds some, sometimes very uh, not logic. But um, yeah, so uh, there are different different fun fundings and United Nations probably is the first uh, organization working with that. But I know smart agri hubs are also doing something uh, for the for those regions, but I'm not uh, not um, straight into that. So. Perfect, no problem. Um, Anik, did you notice during COVID-19, was there a different request for the types of technologies maybe that were needed to be deployed on farms? Or did you find from a farming advisor perspective that the questions that were being asked of you were different maybe in relation to technology? No, not really on, on farm level technologies. And of course, quite obvious, uh, we, we're dealing with the online meetings and everything, but that's that's not uh, very specific for on farm level. But Due to this digital era, the farmers do think more in a way about technology. So I think the, the way of thinking has been changed during the COVID-19 period. That's at least a movement I think that's, that is, is, is starting now. Great, thank you. And um, we've just started to run short of time, but thank you so much, Christina, Ethan and Anik. Um, I'm going to now introduce uh, George Beers. Um, he's the horticulture engineer and he holds a PhD in management science with a thesis in project management. He's a specialist in strategic information management and agribusiness. He's also the coordinator of the Smart Agri Hubs project, which is a 20 million EU project under Horizon 2020. And it brings together a consortium over 164 partners across Europe, and, and they've been building out a network of digital innovation hubs across Europe over the latter number of years. The project aims to realise the digitalization of European agriculture by fostering an agricultural innovation ecosystem dedicated to excellence, sustainability and success. I'll hand over to George to wrap up and to draw a conclusion. Thank you. Okay. <laughs> Thanks, Hazel, for this uh, introduction in high speed. Um, yeah. 
as a as a coordinator of a project like uh, Smart Agri Hubs, your daily work is not that exciting. You have to deal with a lot of uh, administrative stuff, procedures, legal and financial issues. But I can say uh, from the bottom of my heart that events like today really makes it worth. This is really what motivates me to go through the first every day, the, the daily first. It was exciting and I truly enjoyed the, the whole uh, the whole event. It was great. Um, uh, why was it great? Because, well, what we saw today is a combination um, uh, of young farming, uh, female farming and digitalization, how they uh, come together and, and, and make uh, an interesting perspective on the future for agriculture. I really uh, think that's, uh, that's very valuable. Um, I was quite aware that um, uh, uh, digitalization would help to attract more young people to come to, uh, to the agricultural sector. Um, and as Diana clearly uh, stated that uh, there's, a, there's an urgency, uh, we really need more young farmers. And maybe a learning from today is that women, uh, women involve, female involvement in farming can be also a catalyzer for attracting young people to the agri-food sector. So um, I think that's one thing that we need to, to chew a little bit more on. Uh, and um, um, there was also a question about uh, what, uh, what is the role of, of projects like Smart Agri Hubs and Demeter and, and a couple of others in this, uh, this perspective in, in uh, renewing the agricultural sector by digital, by female and, and, uh, and the young farming. Um, I think um, it's important that we have events like this to create awareness, to, to put it on the agenda, um, not only for ourselves, but also for those who are uh, watching us. Um, it's also important uh, that, that it makes you your, 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 let's say, commitment stronger if you're not alone. And I think today also proves that we are, uh, well, the network is growing and growing. And that's, that's a good, uh, good thing. And I also want uh, everybody to be aware that uh, uh, Smart Agri Hubs, as well as the major, this kind of projects, they within the commission, they are flagship projects. So the people from the commission are looking over our shoulders and they're, I, I have to say, I, I, I can say that they are very interested in how we are uh, dealing with uh, the, the young farming issues, the, 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 female, the, the, the gender issues. Uh, related to digitization, it's uh, they're really eager to uh, to know about our experiences in this, and also to to see the the, the great examples. Um, please be aware that uh, in Smart Agri Hubs we have an extremely strong communication team. So, literally thousands of people are following us, and so this also this this event today will be available for those thousands of people. And if only 5% is taking a look, it's already have a, a big impact. So that um, uh, brings me to, um, to thank, no, that's not good, to compliment and to thank uh, and, and, and really uh, express my exploration for the wonderful presentations that we had today. It was great, uh, uh, great illustration of, uh, of success stories and it really gives uh, hope for the, for the future. So I really want to thank and compliment the presenters, the presenters uh, for today. Um, I also want to uh, to thank the participant that joined joined us today, and not only for joining us, but also give your opinion in the in the Mentimeter. It was great to have a good uh, impression of and, and some confirmation of the feelings that you had. I also want to thank uh, Kevin, Kevin Dulin, and uh, the Demeter Project for joining us in this uh, this type of events and uh, to, to give your commitments and, and uh, uh, co-organizing these events. Um, many thanks and also the compliments for uh, uh, Hazel and her team, the regional cluster of uh, UK and Ireland, uh, but also of course for the technical support by Margot and, uh, and Pep. Uh, thanks for running such a smooth uh, um, event as we, as we experienced today. Uh, having said that, uh, um, we are, as from Smart Agri Hub's perspective, we are working on a, uh, a developing a strong network. And um, so far, uh, we are um, 
doing well. We managed to have virtual uh, meetings more and more, and uh, they are very professionally organized. And um, But I also noticed that in our community, there's an eagerness to have a physical meeting. <laughs> Let's meet physical, because in creating a network, it's not only about uh, the the professional touch, but also there's a, a, you want to know more about the people that that are behind this professional stories, and so really to make a network and and share the common interests uh, also on a personal level. So with that, uh, I can announce that uh, we have good news for that. Uh, together with uh, uh, a lot of other projects that are working on uh, digitization of uh, agriculture. We are preparing a, a physical event, uh, a large event that will take place in uh, mid-September. So it depends on the availability of the venues. It will be mid-September in Lisbon. And um, I really hope, <laughs> oh, I'm looking forward to that very much. I really hope that uh, to see all of you there. Um, there will definitely we will organize uh, sessions on young farming, on gender, and uh, probably also the combination of those. So I really hope to uh, to see all of you there in Lisbon in September. And uh, that's what um, that's it for today. I want to thank you for uh, for uh, being with us today, and uh, I wish you a very great day and hope to to meet you in uh, in September. Thanks. Thank you very much, George.